the Pope and Young Club wants to welcome you as we rally together to ensure our bow hunting opportunities for today and tomorrow. You've come to the podcast that believes in preserving, protecting, and promoting the passion for bow hunting. Join us as we strive to be the voice of today's bow hunter. This is the Pope and Young Podcast. Hello, everybody. Jason Roundsville here, joined as always by my co-host Dylan Ray. And we have with us Matt Ross, who is the Director of Conservation with the National Deer Association. Matt, thanks for jumping on here with us. Appreciate uh, you having us. I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys. Yeah, you know, um, you look at, I think sometimes we have such good partnerships with organizations and with people in the industry that you sometimes you just take them for granted. And I think, you know, NDA is one of those things where it's like, yeah, of course we're partners with them. Who, who wouldn't know we partner with them, you know? And, and so it just seemed natural. So we appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about deer or whatever you guys uh, want to jump into for topics. Uh, I, yeah. uh, I've been following uh, the podcast and uh, I'm honored, honestly, to be one of your guests. Well, we're happy to have you. And, you know, we just uh, we said Remy Warren, you know, big time bow hunter on here. We're talking about duck hunting with him. So we have, you know, the National Deer Association guy. We thought we'd talk, uh, you know, a little bit about dog training. <laughs> that sounds just, good to me, uh, Jason. <laughs> just good. So, uh, no, obviously, and and I think when it comes to deer, there there are some big things going on right now, and and I hate to just always go to CWD, but that's that's obviously one of the big things in in a deer population all across the country, and so obviously that's something. But we'd love to hear about. I know you guys have a lot of, of things going on with, with some of your programs. And so we want to hear about what you guys are up to and what you're excited about. Oh yeah. Great. I can, uh, I can paint a little bit of a picture of what's going on in our conservation department. We've got a lot, lots of things happening at NDA um, across the board. Um, you know, I'll, I guess I'll, you want me to start telling the listeners a little bit about myself and my role. What yeah, I do, absolutely. What I do. Yeah. Tell us about uh, you and how, how you got where you are with, with NDA of the director of conservation. Sure. I, uh, that, that'll definitely, um, you know, paint a picture of kind of our department and what we do. Um, so I, I've been with the company for a fair amount of time. Uh, I, this will be my coming in the 2023 will be my 17th year. Um, now, if you hadn't heard of National Deer Association, you may have heard of the Quality Deer Management Association. And that was the original company that I was hired under is QDMA. And so I've been with uh, the company for that long in a variety of roles. Uh, but today as a director of conservation, I oversee, we have staff across the country. We're a, we're a uh, organization that no longer has a brick, brick and mortar. After COVID, uh, we sold our headquarters and uh, everybody works from home at this point. Um, certainly uh, a lot more fluid and efficient that way. And uh, I'm talking to you from upstate New York. I've always worked from home, even though I've been with the company that long. And um, we have staff across the country, some of them uh, in our conservation department specifically. Uh, some of them work uh, hand in hand with state uh, wildlife agencies, like they do tasks that are related to or with the state wildlife agencies. Some of them, their salaries get paid partly by them, partly by us, um, but they handle chronic wasting disease sampling, uh, working with landowners to give them advice, uh, form wildlife management cooperatives or give habitat management advice, um, get people enrolled in different programs like deer management assistance program is one that you can get extra tags. So those are some of the services that they, they do. Um, we have staff that oversee our education and outreach program. So we have uh, classes you can take uh, online or in person. And so I have a gentleman that oversees that. Uh, we have a program that um, if you want somebody to come look at your property. Uh, we have a list of people that have been approved by us that, you know, he oversees that program as well. Uh, we have a uh, Jason was commenting. We're on Zoom right now, uh, commenting on my background uh, in my Zoom screen. 
Uh, we have a program where we work with uh, federal government and state agencies on improving public land. So it's not all private landowner based stuff. Although, in all honesty, most deer uh, in the United States are killed on private land. Um, I mean, it's the majority. Do you know that? Do you know that percentage by chance? Yeah, we'll actually be publishing this in our next 2023 deer report. We come out with an annual like report on the status of the deer herd, and so I don't want to give away that number, but it's close to 90 percent of all deer are killed on private land. Wow, it's it's, ve- it's very hot. Um, but uh, public land is there's over 600 million acres of public land out. And uh, a lot of people don't own land, and so they use public land. Uh, a lot of people that are getting into hunting use public land as well. Uh, the research shows that uh, most people that uh, primarily hunt on public land um, tend to, or at least the people that are just getting into hunting that use it, come from a background that that wouldn't own it. So. Uh, one of the programs that we launched a couple of years ago or just just over a year ago is um, with an initiative to try to improve a million acres of public land by 2026. So that's a program that we oversee as well. And so we have uh, agreements and contracts with the U.S. Forest Service uh, across the country. Um, we work with um, other federal entities, but state agencies as well. And so basically this is real on the ground, like you know, get your boots dirty type stuff where we get a contract and try to uh, get open access and improve public land. So that's another thing we do. Um, And it goes on and on. I just mentioned the deer report. That's a big uh, report that we do annually. That'll be coming out beginning of this next year. So you'll hear about all the stats that are coming out of last year's deer harvest, um, the last full season of deer harvest data that we have and all, all the major issues that are impacting deer and our thoughts on that. So we, we're in the midst of publishing and working on that right now. Our whole staff is working on it. And so, I mean, I can go on and on, but we, we got our hands in a lot of, lot of buckets. Uh, a little, so, uh, I am, well, you're, uh, you're, uh, I mean, you represent a pretty, pretty big bucket. I mean, the national deer association, that's, that's a big bucket. It's not like two States. No. Yeah, we, we cover the country. We work with all the state agencies. Um, prior, prior to working for the company, though, I, I, uh, I'm i a deer hunter first and foremost. I mean, I should say that as well. I mean, that's what got me into the career is I wanted to learn as much about deer. And uh, I went to school for deer biology. And uh, um, prior to, to coming to the organization, I, I worked for a private consulting company. Um, writing deer management plans, forest management plans, you know, uh, prescribing advice. So like somebody would hire us and say, Hey, how do I make my property better? And those, those are the kinds of things I did prior to, to this, but that was, that was over 15 years ago. Um, today we, we talk about it and we do it and, and we do it everywhere. So it's good. No, that's, that's good. And I, I personally respect somebody who goes into wildlife the wildlife industry just because they want to learn how to hunt better so or be more successful yeah, I, there's I something about that. something about deer they're very enamoring uh you know millions of people chase them uh, as you guys know um you know there's a lot of big game species out there but deer are the most accessible accessible just because there's so many of them they live everywhere they live in cities and grasslands and woods and you know all kinds of places so they're they're easy to get to, and and there's a lot of them. So that's that's one of their their biggest um, positives, I guess. They drive a lot of money in the industry too, which is good. Yes, they do. Yeah, how many deer hunters are there in, in the U.S.? The last uh, estimate that was done through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service does a national survey of all sports, recreation, fishing, hunting, wildlife uh, watching even, and they do it every five years. Um, they're actually in the process of doing the next round of that. So uh, I'm not sure how early it'll get released, but next year um, they should be publishing the, the the latest version of it. They've been doing it for decades. And the l- latest data from Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the longest trend data, 
So there was a little bit over 11 million hunters, uh, like 11 and a half, 11.7 million total hunters, and about 9 million of them were deer hunters. Now that means those people hunt other things too, but um, you know, in the United States, about 9 million. The, uh, the, we also ask, states keep track of this as well, um, just to kind of, you know, obviously they sell licenses and they know how many licenses they sell. And uh, in our uh, deer report last year and this year, we asked that question. The deer report is a, an amalgamation of um, questions we ask all the states and we, we compile all those in one place. And it's also um, some of the biggest issues that we think are happening with deer and we, we research that. Um, but every year we ask how many total hunters do you have? Deer hunters, bow hunters, um, muzzleloader hunters, rifle hunters, and there's overlap. And so you can, uh, you can follow those statistics in our deer report too. And those stats are coming right from the state agencies. And I think this year's report, I was just reading the chapter, the draft of the chapter, um, yesterday or day before yesterday. It's again, it's like 8.9 million. It, it dropped a little bit. Um, but all hunter numbers are slowly declining. So close to 9 million deer hunters in the United States. Um, uh, in Canada, I think it's close to, um, we didn't get a, a survey response from every province, but we got five of the seven provinces responded and it was 700,000, I think up in Canada for, for at least those that responded to the survey. What's the, what would you say the biggest, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What, what would you say the biggest victory is in, in the deer hunting world specifically as far as conservation goes in the past, you know, four or five years? There's some good, there's some good victories. There's a lot of negatives as Jason alluded to before, yeah. you know, things that are, uh, what are, what is really bad. Um, but on the victory side, on the positives, I'll tell you, you know, one of the, the greatest things that's happened is even though we are losing hunters is I think our deer hunters today are more informed partly because of phones and the internet. Um, but they're more informed and engaged than they ever have been. You know, like if you think right. about the, the, the longer span of deer hunting, um, you know, going back the fifties and sixties and seventies, you know, deer hunting was a recreational getaway from home type of thing. Um, and there's some there's some drawbacks to people being super, super average engaged. But at the same time, it's overwhelmingly positive that that folks that that hunt deer care. They're passionate about it. They pay attention to changes in regulations. They voice their concerns when those things they don't like it. <laughs> Um, they, we have, you know, hunters are more tuned in and what's going on with deer today just because of trail cameras. And so, you know, they share pictures with each other or they send them to state agencies or they post them on social media. And so hunters are paying attention to things that, you know, back in the fifties, those things didn't exist. So you'd go out right. for two days and hunt and you disengage. Um, so you know, that's one of the successes is I think hunters care more and know more than they ever have. And they voice their concerns. And uh, that's good. We need that. We need people that care and, and speak, speak their mind. Um, probably another positive is the deer herd today. Um, you know, populations go up. It's always in flux. They're going up and they're going down. It's really hard to manage a population in a stable state you can't do that i mean you shoot too many and it drops and then you don't shoot enough and it goes up um even i mean i'm in my later 40s even in my short history of hunting i mean i've been hunting close to 30 years but um you know in the last three decades we've had way too many deer and then there was a point like the mid 2000 teens where people were crying because deer numbers or deer harvests were crashing going down a lot so i've seen both ends of the spectrum but i had I, I hadn't seen you know back in the when our parents were hunters you know and saying hey it was rare to see a track it was never that low but i will say the second thing besides being super engaged hunters is deer herds are although there are diseases and some other concerns out there um from a 
um, condition and from a composition standpoint, like numbers of bucks versus does, um, age structure in the deer herd uh, for bucks particularly, it's never been as good as it is right now. Um, having really good even ratios of bucks and does out there, um, shooting enough does to keep populations in check, not having too many deer, um, and having deer in all age classes. And a lot of people think when you hear deer in all age classes, it's all about antlers and big antlers do come with older age, but from a biological standpoint, um, it really, they're, they're a social creature. Anybody that hunts deer that's listening understands this. You know, they leave scrapes and rubs and they vocalize. You can buy grunt calls. You can buy dopey. You know, you, all of these things are you're trying to mimic the social interactions between deer. Deer are very social. They leave sign and scent and they communicate with each other quite a bit. And when you have an imbalanced deer herd, meaning there's not good representation and there's no balance, like there's not an even buck to doe ratio or there's not any older bucks represented, things go askew uh, from breeding chronology, um, when fawns are born, the overall health of the population. So we want it to be balanced. And so really today at a national level, um, it's not bad. It's pretty good, actually. Um, yeah. Undershoot a lot of does when they used to not. Um, there's more older bucks in the population than there have been in a long time. And that trending, that trend is continuing to improve. And it's about as best as it's ever been since we've been tracking it. So that's another good thing, Dylan, is is the the health of the deer herd. Now, what you said there's some negatives that go along with hunters being so invested. What what are those negatives you think? You know, that's that's a good question. So I'm sure you guys know this too. You know, uh sometimes when hunters get super invested, they almost feel ownership of the deer. Um, you know, deer are they're a free-ranging wild animal and they should be that way. Um, they're owned by the people, you know, they're protected by federal law to be a public resource. And so when people get super engaged and uh, a deer they're following feel, they feel like somebody else gets it. It's not fair. You know, so you can get, uh, some heated arguments either digitally or in person. Um, you know, maybe it can take a little bit of the fun and mystic mystique away of, out of hunting too, you know, like knowing too much of what's going on out there. Um, there's times that I feel like, uh, I just want to go sit out there and not know what's out there where, uh, you know, trail cameras give away all the story. Um, but probably the biggest thing is, uh, you know, in fighting within hunters. Yes. Uh, that's exactly between, what I was going to say. Between groups that, you know, use different things or in a community people might. Um, but I think, I think overwhelmingly the positives outweigh the negatives there. Yeah, for sure. I would also say, and you alluded to this in the fighting aspect, but just the social pressure of deer hunting now. Yeah. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, new hunters feel this pressure to kill these giant animals because that's what they see on Instagram. Yeah. And they, they don't understand how difficult it is to kill a 175 inch deer, but that's all they see. That's all they think's out there. And then they shoot their 110 inch, 120 inch deer. And they're like, well, I must not be a good hunter because they're killing these giants. Yeah. And I'm not. And just that social pressure that comes along with like everybody being deer experts now, you know, or at least portraying that they're deer ex experts. Now it just puts a whole lot of stress on that new hunter, or that, that struggling hunter. And, um, so that would definitely be my biggest negative on that side of things. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that, that is definitely true. Yeah. And I think part of that is, you know, it's why I appreciate the records portion of our organization yeah. is because we are the absolute truth tellers. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you go on Facebook, I'm like, wow, I'm apparently the only person in the hunting industry who hasn't killed a 200 inch deer. Because everybody else kills 200 inch deer. And then that's the nice thing is you look at what we do in our records program is we're the ultimate truth tellers. We're like, oh, you know, now it's a 165. That's not exactly 200 inch, you, no matter what you tell your buddies. And so I, I, 
for me, that always, I always appreciate that thing because you, you can't BS a tape measure. Well, and I heard it out of somebody's mouth. Uh, I said, "Are hey, you're not getting into that deer," and he said, "I can't be entered." And uh, you know, I, I'm not saying I know the guy really well. I'm not saying he did anything illegal or you know was out spotlighting or you know I'm not saying anything like that. But why can't it be? You know, my right. guess is my guess is high fence. Um, you killed it in the high fence. You didn't want to say that on social, but you can't enter it because it's not fair chase, you know? Um, and so that, that type of thing, like people don't get, and, and you go back to public ground, you know, a lot of those new hunters are, are stumbling out on public ground. It's really hard to find a 200 inch deer on public ground near impossible. If I might say, um, because there's been, you know, hundreds of hunters walking through there, flinging bullets every which way before you. And, uh, it becomes really difficult to nail down those giant deer on public ground. Um, but they get this perception from social media again that, you know, and, and of course that guy's not commenting saying, Hey, I was hunting a super, super, you know, um, well-managed property that runs a, a seven seventy thousand dollar you know, protein feeder system and the deer are coming right. in on feeders every, you know, they don't say that type of thing. All they see on social media is, man, these guys are all killing 100, 180, 200 inch deer. And, and all I can find is 110 inch deer on public ground. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I think you know today there's um there seems to be on from a you know media production standpoint or whatever um, a transition to um, we're starting to see some really good storytelling. Not that there hasn't been, but I think um, from the perception of it's easy because there's these you know shows that uh, that show how many big deer going down. Um, there are some more like. Uh, uh, you know, realistic production companies that film it all and show the whole story that that have been uh, emerging lately. Like um, the hunting public. That's a good example. Yeah, that's example. An exactly one of the ones I'm thinking of. And uh, it's more about the, the adventure and the journey to get to the deer. And even then, um, Jason said it exactly, the, the records program is not only the ultimate truth teller, but it shows a great demographic distribution of the truth. Yeah. Like where it happens, what's what's top, but also what's average. You know, what's an average deer in one place might not be one in another, and yep. that will allow people to change their expectations. What's um, the national average for for whitetails with archery equipment? Do you know that? Do you, I mean I don't know if we know that from a Pope and Young side of things, but you mean score? I mean we could find yeah. it out. I, I bet. I, I bet for you mean for like a mature whitetail? Yeah. Uh, like a five, I would guess for a five-year-old deer, this is just a guess. Um, I had heard some research and this is like maybe six, seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but I think uh, the average five and a half year old killed in the United States, you know, just kind of like using the whole U S as the blanket scores probably close to 130 inches. I mean, that's, it's not high. Yeah. That's it, good. It, that's what, that's what yeah. I would guess. Yeah. I think, I think it was one, 27 but I, like it was almost 130 inches but then if you take that same data set which would probably be you know hundreds of thousands of animals and you drilled in on a state like where i live new york it's not going to be the same as the average five and a half year old somewhere else and so it's always it always comes with um you know what's the what's the definition and where are you talking about what's the location well, that's another thing is like, you know, I'm a big preacher of like, quit trying to shoot a 180 because all you've got is 140s, dude. And you're going to create so much frustration for yourself. Like, yeah. I'm never going to kill a 200 inch deer on the properties that I have access to. Never. Yeah. Uh, because there's no 200 inch deer there. Um, we we talk about problem. hunter expectations a lot. Like, yeah. you know, from from the NDA's perspective is expectations are are a balance of the property's potential, you know, like you're talking about Dylan, like what can it produce? What's, what's historically taken in that area? Um, you can improve on that, you know, through yeah. habitat management and working with your neighbors and that's stuff we can teach, but you use that as a baseline. And then you also have to like balance that all with, uh, you know, how much time do you have and how much money and resources do you want to dump into this? Because, not everybody has every weekend or even every day to hunt. You know, a lot of people only have a limited amount of time. And uh, 
if you're okay not shooting something and you're limited on time, that's okay. But if you really want to shoot something, that's part of the discussion you need to have with yourself in terms of your expectations. Well, that's, you know, that's another thing you go, but we just, like Jason talked about, we just had Remy Warren on and, and you look at him and you're like, crap, dude, how are you killing all these giant animals in a year? Well, he sets aside literally yeah. 120 days a year. Like, yeah. I mean, a third of his year, he's in yeah. the field. And that's, I mean, n- most people, you know, have, like you said, they have two weekends or three weekends or yeah. Thanksgiving break or Christmas break or, you know, and they've got four or five days to go out and kill a deer. And, you know, to have the expectations of, I want to go out and shoot 180 inch deer. All you're going to do is walk away disappointed. All you're going to do is walk away thinking, man, I suck because everybody else is doing it. Why can't I, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, you've got four days on public land to do it. Like that's, that's a, a, a massive and, difference. And, and that's why I think some of these storytellers that are emerging uh, are, are good. They're good for hunting, you know, like to yeah. talk about not only to, to share more about the, um, the camaraderie and like the adventure of hunting, not just the end result, which is what I feel like in like, when I was younger, uh, you know, a lot of outdoor television, they told, they showed the end result, like the kill rather than all the stuff that went into it. And now there's Process, a bunch of production yeah. companies that show, you know, everything that leads up to that. Um, but I also think that some of these newer producers are shooting more average deer because that's what they have access to. And that helps the image of you're not going to shoot a Pope and young deer. Uh, you know, you can, you can try to, but you're going to see more average deer when you go hunting. That's not, you're not going to see a, a giant every time. Well, and that's what, you know, that, that's another big, uh, another big topic that, that we talk about a lot. Uh, Nick is that, uh, uh, not Nick, Matt, that, that is a big talking point for us. Um, you know, we think we get associated with the biggest, baddest animals in the country. Oh, you're Pope and young. You only care about the biggest, baddest animals. Do minimum for a white tail, typical white tail is 125. Like if you've spent a lot of time in the woods, you've probably seen a 125. You've probably killed yeah. a 125. You know, I, I've talked to so many guys and they're like, oh, dude, I could only dream of killing a book animal. And I'm like, do you know the minimums? And they're like, yeah, it's like 190. And I'm like, dude, it's 125 <laughs> inches. And he's like, I've got five on the wall back home that I know will score over 125. I'm like, yeah, you know, like most... Most guys who, you know, have spent a, an adequate amount of time in the woods and developed as a hunter have probably shot a 125 whitetail. Um, but we get that that misconception of like, well, you only care about giants. And just yesterday, just yesterday, I posted a picture, Jason, um, uh, of a giant, beautiful, cool six point. Uh, it was that one I was hunting in Missouri. You, I showed you a picture of it. One of my buddies ended up killing it. And I was pumped. It was his first, dude, it was his first buck ever. Uh, let me just awesome. pull this up. Shout out to, to to my friend, my my good buddy Joey Zapmary. Um, this was his first book ever, a giant six point in in Missouri. Wow! <laughs> and I posted this picture, and some some guy commented and said, well, "I'm surprised that even makes book." And I commented and I said, "Nobody said it made book. Like I didn't say it was a book animal, but it's right. a proud hunter with a good whitetail. Why are we going? What what, uh, what, yeah, what are you trying to allude to here? Yeah, yeah." All I said was congratulations on a great buck. I didn't say it was a book animal. Um, right. But again, we all, we get that association of you only care about giant whitetails. No, 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 no. Far from it. We care about all whitetails. And, you know, and in fact, our minimums are much lower than you might ever imagine. Yeah. Uh, if Unless you just buy into the whole hype of, oh, they only care about big animals. So I'm not even going to check the minimums. You know, that that's, first of all, that's a great deer. And uh, um, that brings up a thought that I have is, uh, one of the things that, you know, I think as hunters get more engaged, get more informed, and one thing that they that they can do to somewhat help with their expectations, but at the same time, change the, the conversation about what is a trophy, is trying to go for those deer that are in that, like, top 5% or 10% of what's out there, what's available, right? And so most bucks, whitetail bucks, um, are almost pre-programmed to be an eight pointer, right? So number of points might be one of those discussions, one of those conversations. And uh, you can see nine, 10, 12 pointers and mo- way more than that, obviously. And you can see deer that are smaller, but a mature buck, um, you know, f- five or older, four or older, but you know, most of them are going to be eight points. Even after two years old, they're going to be eight points. 
that deer, I guarantee, is an older deer just based on his head size yeah, and everything. 100%. And he, yeah, he was. and he only had six points. And so one of my, our founder, actually, uh, Joe Hamilton, one of his like, you know, dream deer and what he always tries to kill is a mature six pointer because they're rare. You just don't see yeah. a lot of big six pointers. And then the same thing with age. Um, we teach at NDA how to age deer on the hoof. It's not an, it's not an exact science, but you can get pretty close, you know, just like anybody looking at, you know, go to the, you go to church, you go to the grocery store, you look across, you know, people in front of you, you might not be able to guess exactly how old I am, but you can put me in the bucket of, is he in his twenties? Uh, is he in his forties or is he in his sixties? Right. Ah, uh, well, he doesn't look young and he, and I'm not near retirement, so I'm probably in the middle. You could do the same thing with deer. You can say, okay, deer's young, middle, or old. And just Dylan showing his phone on screen here, I could tell that was an older deer, just based on his body. And uh, one of the things that you can do as a hunter is, you know, antlers are important, and they're a reflection of age, because the, the older a deer gets, the bigger its antlers are going to be, generally. Um, but I just, just said something about the average score. But one thing that I like to do is just kind of push it to an older deer for what I'm trying to shoot, no matter what's on yeah. its head, is I really want to shoot a four or older deer in New York. It's hard. You know, no matter how much it scores with my bow, that's what I want to do, a four or older. And uh, I see a lot of deer that are two and three that I don't shoot. And it's just me challenging myself because I want to shoot a deer that's in those older age classes. Um, Speaking of maturity levels, I, uh, you guys work, yeah, National Deer Association down there in the corner. Yep. Um, I just bought one of these. Um, Ryan Kirby is the artist, and these yep. are all hand drawn pictures. This is, in my opinion, one of the coolest pieces of artwork I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, Ryan's great. We were, dude, we, he, he approached us and asked if we would work with him on it. He did another one. Um, so this is the growth and maturity of the white-tailed buck, and it breaks down all the ages. And then, yeah, and the, the anatomy, anatomy and physiology. We worked with him on that um, as well the next year. They're both awesome posters. Well, I got, like I said, I, I mean, I got one of each. And perfect example is uh, Joey. You know, I I was showing him these, and I, I was walking him through these things. And I'm like, uh, okay, so if we're looking at, and we're looking at growth and maturity. And I'm like, so let's look at this. Let's not look at his head at all. Uh, but let's look at these other features and, and uh, I shouldn't say head at all, but let's not look at the antlers at all. Mm. Let's look at these other features and decide a, a, a mature whitetail. And so then we're hunting and, uh, you know, this deer comes out first day and I'm like, Hey dude, that's a, it's a good buck. If you want to shoot it, shoot it. And to be quite frank, it had a lot bigger antlers than the one, than the 60 shot. But he's like, well, he, he doesn't look that old, you know, based off that picture you were showing me, doesn't look that old. I'm like, well, he's not that old, but a good buck man it's your first year if you want to shoot it shoot it and uh and then we're hunting and that six comes out and he's like dude that's the one like you can just tell he runs this place and he just he's big he's beefy he's mature he's got a fat neck on him you know and, yeah. and i'm like yeah you made a good choice there dude let's shoot it and uh but that's that's going back to, to to hunters being educated and understanding deer and you know i hung those in my basement and i told my wife that's one of those things like you should look at this and you should study this every year before hunting season. Like yeah. every year you get ready to hunt, you should be looking at these things and familiarizing yourself with characteristics of a mature deer. Um, but no, I thought, I just thought about that because I remember seeing the NDA stamp on that and uh, just thinking how cool that was. So yeah, those are, those are great education pieces for hunters to, to look at. Um, there's other resources. You don't have to buy that poster, but it's a great right. poster. I mean, I'll plug, I'll plug Ryan. He, he's amazing. Um, but we have even just save the picture on, on your phone too. <laughs> What's that? I said, even just save the picture on your phone. Um, yeah. you know, but, but no, it is, it is really cool. So we, we did a, um, I mean, we have a, we have stuff in on our website that's free and, uh, you can read or download, you can buy stuff. But one of the more recent things is not something on our website, but we did a, um, masterclass with on X hunt. They do a, uh, yeah. weekly, um, evening webinar, but it's recorded and archived on YouTube. You can go find it. Um, where Kip Adams, who's our chief conservation officer, and I both spoke. Kip did aging on the hoof, which is what Dylan just talked about. Is basically went through a series of pictures and videos of uh, how to tell how old a buck is, 
And then I followed that up the second half of it with um, uh, aging teeth. So once you kill a deer, if you really want to know how old it is, you can tell by its teeth. And so I did uh, uh, like step-by-step process that when you kill a deer, buck or doe, and you get the jawbone, um, one way you can tell how old it is for real is there's science behind it is look at the wear and replacement of, of the teeth. So I covered that. Yeah. I shot a deer in Oklahoma, uh, this year, didn't have a tooth in his head. Really? Yeah. Just a giant old warrior buck and didn't have a tooth in his head. And like, you know, not impressive antler wise. Uh, but just again, like, like, uh, Joey alluded to when we were hunting, like, when he walks out, you're like, dude, that's, he runs this place. Like he runs this, this part of the woods, just a big old warrior buck. And then I shot him and yeah, I didn't have a tooth in his head, but awesome. really cool. You should, uh, if you still have the jawbone, take one of the, uh, the front teeth, the incisors, you can mail them away. There's three or three labs out there that you can get them, uh, aged through another methodology where they, they cut the, the tooth and they stain it and put it on a slide and really here. Uh, on the root of the tooth, it's better in northern uh, environments than it is southern, uh, in like the deep south anyway, um, because that's to do with the change of seasons. But um, they will be able to, almost like counting rings on a tree, it's called cementum manuli. Um, and it's not that expensive. It's like 20, 25 bucks. Uh, but they'll yeah. tell you if it's a really old deer, like a deer that you can't even, the teeth are that worn. Um, we have... We send away does and bucks that are really advanced aged. And that's a question that we get to at NDA is how old do deer live? Um, you know, the average deer is not going to live past five, but they live into their teens and twenties in the wild. And I personally have mailed away does. This is a, a buck, but, um, does that had like just gums, like nothing left and pulled it in size or mailed it that seen deer come back at 15 and a half, 20 and a half. I mean, crazy, crazy. Old really? Age. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's part of my, you know, that's part people ask, like, you know, Jason asked a lot of our guests, like, what's your favorite animal to hunt? Or like, if you can only choose one, I love whitetails, man, that they can live for so long. You know, I mean, it's crazy to think about seeing a 10, 10 year old buck. Like that's insane yeah, to think. That's super old. Yeah. <laughs> super, super old. I have to do that with the teeth. That interests me. I have to do that. I'll reach out after the after the podcast. I'll tell you the different places you can send them. But there's there's a couple, not a lot. There's a, it's a specialized thing, so there's only a handful of places. So you'll have to let us know how how that one ages out, Dylan. I will. I will yeah. for sure. Is that the most accurate way to tell uh, the age of a deer? It's a good question. Actually, uh, if the deer is truly uh, younger than three, it's a fawn, it's one, it's two or three years old. If that's its actual age, the other method by looking at the jawbone without mailing away the tooth is actually more accurate. And that is specifically because deer replace, just like I have little kids, they're about done losing their teeth, but just like we all are mammals, we lose our baby teeth. Deer are losing and replacing teeth up until they're about two years of age. And really? so that I don't method, guess I've ever heard that. Yeah. That method's more accurate because it has nothing to do with the wear or or cementum. It has to do with what teeth are there. And you should be able to tell that by looking in the jaw. At around three years old, if the deer is truly three, those methodologies are about similar accuracy. And then from like uh four and older the deer is four or five or seven or whatever um the mailing the this the incisor in is more accurate huh that's cool but I mean, it, I, that I, costs I money and that. the other one doesn't <laughs> yeah i've never heard of anybody finding a deer tooth in the woods that <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I find i found skeletons and you can find a jawbone but yeah, for if you think you're a really good shed hunter, now we'll if you're find finding deer tooth, too, now you're now that's the next level. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, that's Jason, you're the next level. You ready to ask ask him the big question? I, I think so. Is it time? Yeah, why not? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, 
and uh, anxious to hear what you have to say about this. Being the, you're definitely uh, gonna be you're definitely gonna beat Remy's last answer for sure. No, no okay. doubt. Yeah, dude, that was weak. I mean, Remy, if you're listening, sorry, but that was just weak. <laughs> um, so anyway, when when you find yourself, whether you're chasing whitetails or or whatever you're you're going after in the woods, what is one piece of equipment, like a non traditional item, that you like to have with you on every hunt? What's a non-traditional um, piece of equipment? I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll so give not, you a, not like binoculars or rangefinder. Something yeah, that's yeah. maybe not everybody I'll give you has. two. I, I'm guessing the first one uh, somebody has said on your podcast before. But first one is I like milkweed pods just to be able to test yes. them. Yes. Uh, um, I don't know if anybody's man. ever said that, but I will keep a milkweed pod in a in a little bag. I have a pouch that straps to my thigh that I keep my range finder in, but I also keep a milkweed pot in there. And the second thing is uh, a Ziploc bag, one gallon Ziploc bag, uh, because if I get a deer, I like, I like deer heart. And so uh, that that's uh, always in my backpack is at least one or two Ziploc bags. We talked about milkweed, didn't we, Jason? You've talked about milkweed. Who was that that we talked about? I'm still I thought we uh, talked yeah, about it. Said we were gonna mail me some. I never saw it, but yeah, I, I yeah. Somebody, anything. somebody mentioned that. I'm trying to remember who it was. They said it was better than than this little smoke in a bottle stuff. Yeah, uh, you know, I think I shared this whenever we talked about it. But but one thing that I like to do, Matt, is I'll take one of those old coin purses. You know, that you pinch yeah. open, you could get the coins out and put the milkweed in there because then it pulls out like a tissue bottle and you know, that, that piece will just come off and you'll have the next little piece hanging out. So you can just grab it and go right there. Do you remember I'm trying the to old, think of who that was though? Do you remember the old film containers? Yes. Yeah. 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 So I, uh, I tried to like fashion something out of one of those. This is like before phones were cameras <laughs> and cameras were phones, but, uh, I tried to find one of those old film containers and I stuffed it with, uh, uh, milkweed and then I cut a hole in the top and put a little piece of uh, like rubber on there so I could do the basically the same thing as the coin purse keep that in there just keep it dry this is a guess Jason but going back looking at our last episodes I'm guessing it was Layden Force from North American Whitetails because he's the whitetail hunter that we last had on so that's all I that, can think of that would have talked about that it. could be it I, I can't recall. We've had a lot of great answers, and I, I'm sorry I didn't recall that one because you loved it because that's something you do. So, yeah, but uh, What's well, um, Remy said oysters. <laughs> yeah, like can, not, oysters. not just oysters, but canned, canned smoked oysters. <laughs> really? We politely told like, Remy that you know. I guess wrong. it's better to eat those on. Yeah, I mean it's it's probably better to eat those like on the mountain or maybe sitting in a tree stand because if you try to eat those while you're salmon fishing or something, like I can see people getting seasick over that. That's just wrong. <laughs> He's got to have one of those strong like psycho uh, somatic whatever like things where uh, smoked oysters make him think of like you know positive experiences and that'll that'll reflect in his hunt. So it's one of those magic bullets. You know, usually yeah. I tell people if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me, you know, but Remy oysters are not good enough for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you what, you're going to catch me shooting a mouth tab before you catch me eating canned smoked oysters. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. So. Well, that's, well, that's great. Well, I'll tell you what, I sure appreciate all the work you guys are doing on behalf of our deer herds all across the country. Um, you know, definitely a, a good partner of ours and we uh, wish you guys continued success and growth and, and can't wait to see the next big thing from, from you guys. Thank you so much, Jason. And same thing, likewise to the Pope and Young Club. Uh, you know, we, we really appreciate everything you guys do. Uh, for all animals, not just deer. And uh, it's it, the partnership is important to us and uh, you guys do great work. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. All right, guys. Thank you for having us. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see you soon and happy holidays. Yep. Same to you.